All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Configuring and Calibrating Smart Instruments, co-hosted by ISA and BMEX. My name is Michaela Cooper. I'm with ISA and I will be hosting today's webinar. Before we get started, I would like to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's session. First, in regards to the question and answer sessions or the Q&A sessions, we will have two Q&A sessions, including one 10-minute Q&A within the presentation and one 20-minute Q&A at the end. If we are unable to get to your question during the one um, that's halfway, uh, we will hold your question till the final Q&A. And to submit your questions, simply type them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. If you are viewing along with others at your site, please designate a scribe to submit your group's questions. Uh, please do not use the chat toolbox for your questions for the Q&A sessions. If you have miscellaneous questions for me, the host, submit those into the chat toolbox. Unfortunately, with this large amount of pre-registrants, we cannot open up the phone lines for questions. Um, only the chat, uh, only the Q&A uh, chat toolbox. If we do not get a chance to respond to your question, or if you would like to discuss a topic more in detail with one of the presenters, feel free to contact them directly, and their information will be given at the end of the webinar. Second, for those of you who just joined, please make sure that you are on mute. Both your computer and phone microphone should be on mute. Um, if you would like to see the phone and audio broadcast connection instructions again, please refer to the confirmation email I sent to you today. If you go to the top left-hand side of your WebEx screen, you'll see a tab labeled Meeting Info, and some of those connection instructions are included there as well. Additionally, once this webinar closes, a survey should pop up in your browser. You'll want to take a few minutes to fill out the survey and tell us a little bit about your experience at today's webinar. And in particular, there will be a question about what topic you'd like to see us present for the next webinar. Please provide us your feedback. We really want you, our audience, to help us determine what the next webinar should be. So just take a few minutes to fill that out. It's a pretty short survey. All right, that takes care of our housekeeping matters. To get started, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Roy Tomolino. Roy is a professional services engineer with BMEX. Roy has been teaching calibration management for 13 years. He has taught on four different continents to people from over 40 countries. He is an accomplished public speaker and facilitator. Roy has worked for Hewlett Packard as a corporate trainer, leading a new product introduction and managing worldwide training activities. He was also previously a key player with Honeywell at their Fort Collins, Colorado office. He supported the document calibration management software and Honeywell's 2020 portable calibrator as a trainer certified developer, and technical advisor. Roy holds a BS in, in Computer Information Systems from Regis University, Denver, Colorado, and AAS Electronics Technology from Denver Institute of Technology, Denver, Colorado. Roy is also Six Sigma Green Belt certified. Today, Roy conducts educational training sessions and provides technical support to BMEX customers. And now on to our next presenter, Thomas. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, I spent uh, six years in the Navy nuclear power program uh, working on submarine tenders and destroyer tenders in the nuclear support facility and also working on nuclear power destroyers uh, and nuclear powered submarines uh, on the primary side plant, uh, replacing primary side valves and other components on those systems, um, you know, made containment vessels and 
actually disassembled the components within the containment uh, areas, and that was a very interesting time. After that, got out and then worked as a plant engineer and chief engineer at various uh, food processing industries throughout Southern California. Um, was primarily responsible for the construction of one of the most uh, modern meat processing facilities of its time uh, in National City, California. And then uh, after that, worked for uh, Action Instruments, which some of you might be familiar with as an application and test engineer for about six years, and uh, learned a little bit more about uh, just how good instrumentation could be. Um, some of the people who are doing cutting edge work happen to be working um, and developing these products in Europe and Scandinavia, and came on board with PR Electronics, a Scandinavian company, uh, in February of 2005, and have been with them ever since. And that's it, Michaela. Back to you. Okay. And Tom, if you'd like to go ahead and go over the agenda. Okay. okay. All right. Sounds good. So today we'll be talking about how to calibrate a smart transmitter, and we're also going to do a quick review of a standard 4 to 20 milliamp output field transmitter. Talk a little bit about the Heart Protocol and how a heart smart transmitter uh, creates increased capabilities on a 4 to 20 milliamp loop. We'll talk a little bit about the physical layer of Profibus PA and found Foundation Fieldbus H1 transmitters. Uh, talk about sources of error that affect all of these transmitter types. Then there will be a Q&A session. And then after that, uh, Roy is going to go ahead and give a live demonstration of how to calibrate some smart transmitters. Uh, another Q&A session after that, and then the conclusion. So at this point, I'm going to pass it over to Roy to talk a little bit about uh, calibrating a transmitter. Go ahead, Roy. Uh, great. Thank you, Tom. Welcome, everybody, to our discussion on calibrating smart transmitters. I'll be doing some live demonstrations with video, and I'll also have another remote controller on the screen to help you see what's going on. Now, right now the, the video image may be large and it may be small, but just know that you can double click on the video itself to either to ch change the side, size, make it go larger or smaller. The first thing I want to show is calibrating a field bus transmitter. We're taking a look at that. The first thing we'll do is verify the transmitter, and we need to hook it up. So there's a couple different things. If I have a four-wire temperature transmitter, and this happens to be a hockey puck, it's, it's kind of difficult to see. We've got different hockey puck options. Normally, you see a transmitter in a, in a large enclosure, maybe a, uh, an explosion-proof enclosure, but this is the heart of the transmitter itself. I have a four-wire transmitter, which means I need four wires. Now, the calibrator itself has two connections for that sourcing of the temperature. So if we're having four wires and we have two connections, we need to do something. I have an RTD connection here. This is a custom-made cable that, that gives me my four wires. And if we have four wires and two posts, we simply join the two together and now plug these two into the calibrator. So if we do that with the calibrator itself, and I'm not going to try to do this whole thing with showing you on the, on the webcam here, but I'll show you on the calibrator. We'll end up connecting these right up here, and this will be sourcing our temperature. RTD uses resistance, so we'll be simulating resistance or sourcing resistance on our temperature transmitter. And let me share one item on the screen here. So I've got the remote controller shared and I've got an, I've got a a viewer up on the screen. And I want you to know that as I press the buttons, let me do this. I'll hit the, the buttons with the, uh, with the blue gears. I can press that, and I can change 
the values. Okay, I hit the wrong one. I can change the values on the calibrator itself. So this is a touch screen, and we can arrow down to change the screens. But this is a little harder to see, so it's easier for me to show you this on the screen. Back up a sec. No, I don't want to save changes. So what I'm testing is a temperature transmitter that happens to be a foundation field bus output. On the screen, it shows us where to plug in for our simulation. On the bottom, we're connecting to foundation field bus. The calibrator itself is providing the source power. So our loop power is coming right from the calibrator. On the screen, we've got our input side, and we have our output. Let me hit start. Our first test point is zero degrees in and zero degrees out. You'll note that there is no 4 to 20 milliamp output on this. This is a purely digital signal. Now, the zero is, would be a perfect if we're sitting right on the zero. The blue dotted lines is the tolerance. As long as our test points land within the blue lines, we know that it's a passing test point. Looking at the graph, we can see the actual error right above the graph. We have about a 0.6 degree error. And it looks like my last test point actually failed. My maximum error was 1.011 degrees Fahrenheit. And I had a, a tolerance of one degree. So the entire test, all the test points needed to be within plus or minus one degree. Let's take a closer look at the data. So here's the graph, a visual of what we had. If I hit the down arrow one more time, we'll see the raw data itself. So my first test point was 0.6 degrees off in the negative direction. So I have a problem with my zero, and I also have a problem with my span. How do we fix that? Well, on an old conventional transmitter, we used one of these, or one of these, or one of these, or one of these. So these are affectionately known as tweakers. They have a small flathead design, and you can grab your instrument, and you can change. You just need to adjust the zero spot, pot or potentiometer. I'll change the zero in the... It's... Okay, there is no potentiometer here. You cannot change this with a screwdriver. This is a smart instrument. You need something with a communicator. You need something that can talk to heart or to foundation field bus or to Propy bus to make this happen. Let's do this. Let me just pause right here. I want Tom to come in and tell us a little bit about heart, about, about field bus, before we come back and actually do the trimming on this. So, Tom, go ahead and take it away. Okay, Roy, thanks a lot. And I'm going to go ahead and get back to the... Thanks, Roy. I'm going to go ahead and get back to the screen here. So obviously, no zero and span potentiometer is located on a smart transmitter. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take a quick look, do a quick review of standard 4 to 20 milliamp transmitters, and then move into heart and move into foundation field bus and profi bus PA transmitters a bit. So first... Look at some uh, 4 to 20 milliamp transmitters here. Nearly, nearly any process signal can be measured by these transmitters. In this example, the transmitter is measuring a thermocouple sensor. Now, the transmitter in this case is a loop power device, and that means it's energized by a 24-volt source that's wired in series with the output loop. Now, the transmitter itself measures the thermocouple, and regulates loop current between 4 and 20 milliamps depending on the temperature of the thermocouple. To measure the transmitter's output, instruments are connected in series with the output loop. These instruments measure the loop current with a resistor that's usually built into the instrument, usually not visible. Typically, the resistor has a value of 250 ohms. And current is common in a series circuit, so the same amount of current is flowing through each resistor. And according to Ohm's law, the current flowing through the resistor times the value of the resistance equals the voltage developed across the resistor. 
So in this example, what you end up with is a 1 to 5 volt signal across the resistors as the temperature changes at the thermocouple. By measuring this voltage, the instruments know the level of loop current and thus the temperature of the thermocouple. Now this type of measurement system has several advantages. It's easy to design. It's pretty darn easy to troubleshoot out in the field. Uh, 4 to 20 milliamp current loops are very immune to electrical noise, so they can run through industrial locations without too many problems. And a 4 to 20 milliamp current loop can be quite long and allowing instruments to be located some distance from the transmitter. However, using the 4 to 20 milliamp field transmitter to communicate a process signal has some limitations. For example, in most applications, only one process signal can control the current on the loop at a time. Also, in this case, you can see there are different brands of devices on the loop and different programming hardware and software is needed to program these different brands of field transmitters and instruments. Also, you, have, you typically have to be at the transmitter or the instrument in order to program it or troubleshoot it. And you cannot easily determine the transmitter's status. Is it in calibration? How well is it working? And you can't easily determine the current loop status. If the current on the loop is 16 milliamps, is it because the thermocouple is at a certain temperature? Or maybe the thermocouple is hotter, but there's simply too much resistance on the loop and it can't get much beyond 16 milliamps. It's hard to know that in this system. So an improvement was made. And here's a, a slide showing a 4 to 20 milliamp transmitter that also communicates via heart. Now, like a standard 4 to 20 milliamp field transmitter, a heart transmitter measures a sensor and it outputs a 4 to 20 milliamp signal. For example, the left graph shows that this heart transmitter has been configured to measure a 0 to 100 degrees C temperature range. And the right graph shows the heart transmitter is producing a 4 to 20 output. So far, it's just like a regular transmitter. However, this heart transmitter produces a digital output. If you take a look at the right graph now, you can see how heart digital communications are carried on the 4 to 20 milliamp loop current created by this transmitter. Now, like any binary code, the heart digital signal communicates by using two numbers, 0 and 1. Well, the heart transmitter, it communicates bit 0 by rapidly changing the level of loop current by plus or minus 0.5 milliamps at a frequency of 2,200 times a second. Bit 1 is communicated by rapidly changing the level of loop current by plus minus 0.5 milliamps, but at a different frequency, a frequency of 1,200 times a second. Now, here's a close-up of a heart message. What you can see here is a series of zeros and ones that are created by dynamically changing the frequency between 1200 hertz and 2200 hertz. Now, since the heart message is varying the loop current the same amount in both directions, you know, plus minus 0.5 milliamps, the net effect on loop current is zero. What this means is, is that a non-heart instrument that's on the loop will still accurately measure the 4 to 20 milliamp loop current, and it's going to ignore heart messages. The heart message carried on the loop changes too fast for an ordinary instrument to detect the digital signal. Now, there are two types of heart messages. Here, heart commands are shown in blue and heart responses are shown in red. Typically, a heart field transmitter will not communicate until a heart master sends a command to the transmitter. In this example, the PID controller is capable of being a heart master. The field transmitter recognizes the heart command sent by the master and it responds, sending the requested data back to the master. <clears throat> now the heart transmitter can be commanded by the master to provide many different kinds of data, including things like the temperature of the sensor, the status of the sensor, is it open, is it broken, is it okay? 
uh, the status of the heart transmitter, the transmitter's PAG number, uh, the internal temperature of the transmitter, and many other pieces of data. Okay, so here's a list of heart commands for a typical heart temperature transmitter. You can see that a heart master can read parameters from the transmitter, and the master can also write changes to the transmitter. All heart devices must support the universal command shown on the left, and most heart devices are going to support at least most of the common practice commands in the center there. There are also device-specific commands that uh, the heart master can access if the device description file for the transmitter has been loaded into the master. The device description file, those can be located at the uh, Heart Communication Foundation website, or you can go to the manufacturer's, the transmitter manufacturer's website for that file. Now, you can also connect a second heart master to the loop. And this master could be a calibrator, or maybe it's a portable battery powered heart communicator. Since the master is portable, since this master is portable, you can communicate with the heart transmitter from anywhere you can physically access the current loop. Now, in most cases, a permanently installed heart master is not used. Most of these heart loops only use a heart handheld communicator which is temporarily connected to the loop and it's used to configure or troubleshoot the heart transmitter. Once the communicator is removed, the heart transmitter receives no commands, and in most cases, it'll just behave like a standard transmitter. For the most part, these don't burst information without being asked for it. So all the transmitter does is it regulates loop current between 4 to 20 milliamps based on the temperature of the sensor. Now, some heart transmitters can measure more than one sensor at a time. These are called heart multivariable transmitters. This is a picture of a gas flow transmitter that also measures the pressure and the temperature of the gas flowing through it. The flow measurement is called the primary variable, and it controls the 4 to 20 milliamp loop current. The pressure and temperature measurements made by this transmitter are the second and third variables, and these measurements are transmitted digitally in the heart message. Now, a heart master flow computer could be used on this loop to measure all three variables. It would compensate the flow measurement as the gas pressure and temperature changes, resulting in an accurate flow measurement under a wide range of conditions. Now, a little bit about uh, wireless heart. This is the latest thing to come along. Heart 7 is a wireless heart protocol. And it should be noted that when you're calibrating a wireless heart instrument, you should do that by connecting to the instrument terminals, not wirelessly. So every heart wireless instrument has terminals on it that have the, the digital information that represents all these variables. The reasons are, first off, when you're calibrating an instrument, it's good to be at the instrument to see the condition of the input signal being fed to the instrument. Example of a wireless pressure transmitter is being calibrated, it would be nice to see if there's any leaks in the pressure source being measured by that transmitter. Also, these wireless heart transmitters usually don't transmit data in real time or even near real time. Typically, they'll transmit data every few seconds or maybe even every 30 seconds or every minute. And when you're calibrating an instrument, you want to know what is the input now what is the output now? You don't want delays in this values because that's going to enter a certain level of uncertainty in your calibration. When you connect to the terminals, the data you get is updated much, much more frequently, typically. Okay, let's take a quick look at the physical layer of a foundation field bus, H1, or Profibus PA physical layer. Now, a smart transmitter used in one of these systems, it communicates by varying the amount of current flowing through the transmitter. 
a 20 milliamp peak to peak current flows through the transmitter when it's communicating bit zero. And approximately 10 milliamps peak to peak flows through the transmitter when it's communicating bit one. Now in theory, up to 32 transmitters can be connected to a communications bus that's energized by a special type of DC power supply that's commonly called a power conditioner. Unlike standard DC power supplies, a power conditioner has a little LC network on it. It's got additional filtering on it. What this does, it clamps when the current flowing back through the power supply starts to alternate too rapidly. This prevents digital messages that are on the bus from being back fed into the power supply, which would, in essence, short out the digital messages. Notice that these transmitters and the power conditioner are connected in parallel with each other, not in series, as is the case in HARP. So this is a parallel bus. Now, at the ends of the bus, there are things called terminations. Each termination consists of two components, a resistor and a capacitor. The resistor is a 100 ohm value, typically, and when the current flow changes through the transmitter, a voltage is created across this resistor. You'll note that the two terminations are in parallel with each other, so the total termination resistance is 50 ohms. This results in a signal of about one volt when the transmitter communicates bit zero, and about a half a volt across that resistor when bit one is being communicated. This voltage signal is detected by the foundation field bus, master or profi bus, PA controller or master. The 100 ohm resistance of each termination closely matches the impedance of the bus cable. And what this does is it keeps these rapidly changing voltage levels from ringing or reflecting off the ends of the bus cable. Now secondly, there's a capacitor there connected to the resistor. And this prevents current flowing through the resistor when the bus is not communicating, when the bus is at a DC state. Okay. Now, one of the advantages of foundation field bus and profi bus transmitters is speed. While a heart transmitter is limited to 1.2 kilobits per second baud rate or speed of, of communication, Foundation field bus H1 or profit bus PA transmitters are much faster. They can communicate at 31.25 kilobits per second. The reason they can communicate faster is because in this physical layer, more power is available to energize the innards of the transmitter. Remember that the heart protocol is communicated on a 4 to 20 milliamp loop. And the protocol, the heart protocol, varies loop current by plus minus 0.5 milliamps. Therefore, a heart transmitter must be able to continue operating even at currents as low as 3.5 milliamps. And that translates, most modern heart temperature transmitters can operate as low as 8 volts, um, potential difference across the loop terminals of the transmitter. So using Ohm's law, you can see that the transmitter must be able to function at around 30 milliwatts. And that's not, much run, that's not much power to run the circuitry of the transmitter, including the microprocessor. So the cool thing is foundation field bus and profi bus standard requires the transmitter used in this physical layer must be able to operate at a minimum of approximately 9 volts and 8 milliamps, which is over 70 milliwatts. And that allows greater selection of a faster microprocessor inside these units. Now, the foundation field bus or profi bus PA segments, they connect to a segment coupler or converter, as you can see on the right. This typically, and there's other choices. You can possibly connect a profi bus PA directly to a, um, a profi bus PA controller, but generally we're talking about going to a coupler or converter which takes 31.25 kilobit per second data rate on the bus and brings it to a higher speed Ethernet network, typically, to go to a foundation field bus master or a profi bus DP controller. Now, the calibrator we're talking about here, it's got a built-in power conditioner, 
which allows the calibrator to energize and communicate with one smart transmitter. Alternately, you can connect the calibrator onto the existing segment that's already energized by a power conditioner and address a specific transmitter to be calibrated. It should be noted if the transmitters are located on a Profibus PA network, then the Profibus master should be disconnected from that transmitter before connecting the calibrator. Okay, now regardless of what kind of transmitter we're talking about, they all are affected by certain sources of error. And this is a partial list of sources of error that affect transmitters. Remember that even when a transmitter has been freshly calibrated, it's going to exhibit some measurement error. You can't do much to change the absolute accuracy of a transmitter, but if the application the transmitter is used in requires measurement of a narrow span, then you can sometimes improve accuracy by calibrating the transmitter to the narrow span instead of leaving it at the full possible input span that can be measured by the transmitter. Now, a big source of error in these transmitters is due to change in ambient temperature. If, for example, you bench test a transmitter at 20 degrees Celsius, and then you install it in a control panel that's got an interior temperature of 60 degrees Celsius, you're probably going to see a significant error in measurement. So to reduce this source of error, calibrate the transmitter at the same temperature that it will be exposed to in the field. And if possible, calibrate the transmitter in place where it's going to be actually located. And if this transmitter is located in a control panel, if possible, calibrate with control panel door closed. Now, over time, transmitters, including smart transmitters, they're going to lose accuracy due to the aging of the components, transducers inside the transmitters. You can calibrate the transmitter, and which will usually bring it back to factory accuracy. But how often the transmitter requires calibration is hard to say. It's usually determined on site empirically. If they, if the calibration team checks the transmitter every six months and finds that it's still within spec, then after a certain number of checks, they might increase the interval to say one year. Now, another source of error is CJC or cold junction compensation error. This is an error that affects measurement when measuring thermocouples. Remember the thermocouple produces at least two volts. First, the voltage created where the thermocouple is measuring the process temperature, and another voltage is created where the thermocouple connects to the transmitter terminals. To make an accurate measurement of the process temperature, the thermocouple transmitter it has to remove the voltage created at the transmitter terminals. And the transmitter does this by measuring the temperature of the terminals and removing the voltage corresponding to the terminal temperature from the total voltage measurement. This is called cold junction compensation, or CJC. It is a big source of error. Now, any error in cold junction temperature measurement will result in an error in the process temperature measurement made by that transmitter. So when calibrating a thermocouple transmitter, you minimize this error by calibrating the transmitter at the same ambient temperature that it normally operates at and make sure that heat is not flowing in or out of the transmitter during calibration, which means stable panel temperature and minimal air movement around the, temperature, around the transmitter. Now, when measuring RTDs, there's an error due to the resistance of the lead wires of the RTD. It's usually not a significant source of error, but if there's a long wire run, it can be. Also, it's a bigger problem when measuring two-wire RTDs. Another source of error that is inherent is called hysteresis, or dead band. This is an inherent characteristic and is a fairly large source of error, especially in transmitters that have a mechanical transducer inside them, like a pressure transmitter or an I to P converter, you know, current to pressure converter, or maybe a valve positioner, things like that. You usually can't get rid of this error through calibration. 
Another thing to discuss is your digital resolution of the measurement and output of these smart transmitters. Usually not a significant source of error, but sometimes when you're measuring a very narrow input span, you can see step changes or granularity in the measured input. Some smart transmitters use a low noise, super linear uh, amplifier on the input called a programmable gain amplifier or a PGA. And when programming this type of transmitter for a narrow input span, the level of gain set in the PGA can automatically increase, providing a full span analog input to the AC converter, even if the measured input span is narrow. The result is good digital resolution even when measuring a narrow input span with this type of transmitter. Just remember that when you calibrate a transmitter that's already configured, you're generally not going to be changing the level of the programmable gain amplifier. This, uh, this change occurs when you configure the transmitter. Another big source of error is electromagnetic interference, or EMI. It's especially a large source of error when you're measuring low-level voltage signals, like from sensors like thermocouples, humidity sensors, and the like. Calibration doesn't help reduce this source of error, but uh, the solution is to increase separation between the source of noise and your measurement point. Okay, so next we're going to have a Q&A session. And then Roy will give us a practical demonstration of uh, how to calibrate some instruments. Thank you. Roy, go ahead. Um, okay. We'd now like to move into our first Q&A session of this webinar. We've already received uh, some good questions, but I encourage you to join the discussion and submit your questions at any time uh, using the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, not to get confused with the chat toolbox, it is the one with the Q&A on it with a question mark. Submit your questions into there. If we miss your question or we run out of time during this Q&A session, then we'll hold it till the final Q&A session at the end. Okay, our first question, let's see, comes from Andrew and he asks, uh, will a heart communicator sim uh, simulate the transmitter well? So I'll, I'll take that one. This is Roy. So the the heart communicator is simply a communicator. It doesn't have the ability to simulate or to measure. So that's when you'd have to use some other element to source the temperature, and you, it would either be a an RTD a, a decade box or something that can can source resistance or a calibrator, even better. Okay. Um, our next question comes from Kevin, and he asks, "How does the this calibrator compare to the Fluke seven five seven fifty four?" So I'll take that one as well. I'm just going to stay high level on this, just because of the the focus of this presentation. The the biggest difference would be that the the MC6 has the full DDs from the factory for the transmitters, and the, the 754 does not. So the the MC6 would allow you to use it as a communicator as well. So that that's the main difference. And if you'd like to take it offline, I'd be happy to talk to you about others, but uh, that's what I feel comfortable going into here. Okay. Um, our next question asks, uh, what can you tell me about HART over Ethernet communications? So with that one, Tom, how do you feel about that? I, I don't feel knowledgeable enough to, to answer that question on that topic. Or, I'd, or else I'd need something more specific. Tom, do you have any comments? Ah, 
where did Tom go? <laughs> you may need to unmute so, yourself if you actually, un- yeah. Yeah, it wouldn't unmute. Um, I can't speak too highly on heart over Ethernet. I don't have a lot of knowledge about it. I can say that connecting a heart transmitter to a device that puts it onto Ethernet, you still have the limitation of the heart speed of 1.2 kilobits per second. You can get more heart transmitters on an Ethernet. Uh, there's more bandwidth present on Ethernet, so you can work with it that way. And you can get into control systems that allow you to do a lot more with the heart signal than you could on a traditional heart loop. But uh, beyond that, it's a pretty general question. So possibly we could give a better answer um, after the presentation if if um, the participant would like a, a more specific question, we could possibly give a better answer. Okay, next question. Can heart be turned off for a smart device? Yeah, if you can go to polling address and you can turn it into multi-drop mode. And I guess the answer really is the smart devices I'm familiar with, they're going to be turning heart. They're going to have heart on at all times. Uh, Roy, do you have anything to add to that? You know, I don't. I don't. Okay. Um, our next question, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing anything, um, I'm in marketing, not too technical. <laughs> um, could you provide some examples of hysteresis error in transmitter, how it is identified? You know, we can, and it's it's hysteresis, and it's the, the difference in the reading from going up versus coming back down. And we'll actually see that in some of the testing. So I'll address that when we get to that point. Okay. And referring to the first question, um, you should mention the loop test capability via heart. So, Paul, that is a good point. And with the with the loop test, it's the communicator is telling the instrument to output 4 milliamps or to output 20 milliamps. Uh, it's a uh, exactly. So it's not a, it's not a complete test. You're 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 testing that the the device itself can actually properly output 4 or 20, and usually it's used to to send a signal off to the control room to see what reading that they're getting instead of testing it as a full loop, which would mean you'd provide an input and then you'd measure the output in current that you'd see. That, that is a good point. Okay. Next question. Is heart communicator the only calibrator we can use to calibrate? Not sure of the question. What the question means? So I'm not positive either. But I, if I could take a stab at it, you need something with a heart communicator to calibrate heart. Now, if in the example, this, the Fluke 754, it does support the what is it? The global commands, uh, but not the proprietary. So you can do some of the commands, but you you need to have something that will source and measure and then something that can do the communication to do the trimming functions. So I, I hope that helped. But if, if you have a more specific question, please lay it out and we'll, we'll address that. Okay, next question. Has heart caused control loop problems that you are aware of? As in uh, dynamic PID control, if that's what the question is addressing, it's a fairly slow communication protocol and usually is not used in control loops. So some slow control loops can be can be controlled as heart providing the process value to the to the PID function, but otherwise no and usually 
I, I would I would say that I have not heard of standard instruments being affected by the heart protocol in the many years I've been doing this. The heart protocol is generally invisible to a standard instrument that's on the loop. It doesn't cause a problem with that with that instrument. Okay. Next question. Is heart multi droop loop actually used with the presence of field bus? I don't understand the question. Uh, heart multi drop, I understand that, but what was the question regarding field bus? Yeah, used with the presence of field bus. Is heart multi drop loop actually used with the presence of field bus? Heart multidrop fixes the output of each heart transmitter at 4 milliamps, and at that point, loop current is meaningless, and the data on the loop is strictly digital. And heart multidrop systems are typically not used with field bus, like foundation field bus. It's simply a heart multidrop system. It doesn't mix with perfect bus PA or foundation field bus H1 um, physical layer at all. Okay. Next question. How much is the value of permissible error? So you define that. In in the example of the field bus temperature transmitter that I'm calibrating, it I have it set to plus or minus one degree. But that's up to you to define what your process needs. Okay. And can you elaborate uh, what burst mode and heart transmitters is? Yeah, burst mode is where a heart transmitter provides data without being asked for data by a master. So a heart seven transmitter, for example, is capable of bursting data onto the loop, and it'll burst it either based on a certain interval of time passing, it'll burst more data, or if the process value it's measuring goes outside of certain user-defined limits, it'll burst data. It can burst data if a certain error is detected. So burst mode is just coming onto the heart scene now, and it, it allows heart masters to listen for data without having to ask for it. Okay, next question. Are there spill letters available for heart devices? Uh, I, I'm not sure what the question is. is it, are there still addresses available for heart devices? That may be what the question is. And in heart seven, the length of addresses is much longer than, than heart five, for example. So developers of heart devices who choose to make them communicate via the Heart 7 stack have a lot of room for creating tag numbers and addresses, much more than in the Heart 5 standard. Okay. And does Heart require calibration before calibrating instruments? Uh, not quite sure of, the, of what that question means. Roy, do you have an idea? I'm trying to think. So I'm not positive either. Heart's a digital protocol, so it doesn't require calibration. If the heart protocol is successfully received, then you've got the message, whatever it is. Um, so that's as far as I can answer that question. I don't, uh, unless the participant can be a little more specific. Okay. okay, and we'll just take one more question here, and we'll have to save the rest for the final Q&A. Um, is config 401 for laptop computers still in use for today's smart transmitters? Mm. 
I believe the answer is limited use, but I'd have to look into that deeper to give a better answer. And I'd be happy to do so if I can get uh, the participant's name or email address. Okay. All right. Well, that wraps up our first Q&A session. And like I said, we're going to hold the rest of um, the attendee questions for the final Q&A at the end. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and pass it off to Roy for him to continue on with the presentation. All right, very good. Thank you, Michaela, and thank you, Tom. Thank you, everyone, for submitting your questions. What I'd like to do now is, everybody, if you have a drink in front of you, grab that. It's time to take a break. Grab your tea, coffee, water. Here we go. All right, now where were we? I need to share my calibrator. All right, so Michaela, just to make sure my calibrator is up, just want to make sure we can see that. Yes, looks great, thanks. Okay, so I stopped exactly where we left off before. We did our as found test on this foundation field bus instrument, and we determined that it failed. And it's not really that difficult to figure out why it failed, but we've got a serious problem. Even at that final test point on the 100% point didn't fail, the entire thing was pretty far out, and we probably would have made an adjustment anyway. So what do we want to do? We grab data. This thing failed. What do we do as a technician? We cancel it, fix it, and retest it. The answer is no, you don't do that. You want to grab this data and save it. As ugly as it is, it is what it is. This is not a reflection on you as a technician. This is simply the instrument itself in question. So we're going to save this. I'll click the disk. We'll save these results. These, this is our as found. Now, we can see that right now we have zero degrees in, and we have a negative 0.5, almost uh, 0.6 degree error just at our zero. So we know this thing is a problem. And if we wanted to verify, we could click in here and simulate a different temperature. And you could do this with an RTD simulator or a decade box. If I put in 500 degrees, then we have an instant output. The instrument is showing us it's almost 501 degrees. We have about a one degree delta on our output. So we need to fix this field bus transmitter. How do we calibrate it? We've already determined we cannot use a screwdriver. So I'm going to show you the super secret button. Don't tell anybody about this. But here it is. Watch the mouse. In the upper left-hand corner, there's a little house with some lines on it. If we click that, down on the bottom, it says field bus. Now, we can start the communicator. We can go in and do different things, but there's even a start trimming option. We want to trim this field bus device. So if I click that same button, on some instruments, there is additional help for you. So let me click trim help. And this tells me I need to make sure that the instrument is out of service. I need to put it into factory trim. And then I need to check the 0 and 100% or trim them both. Then I'll change it back to user trim, and then I'll put it back into auto. So the first thing that we do is go to our mode block. Right now we're in auto mode, but I'll deselect that, put it into out of service, hit the check mark. Now the blue means that there's a change to be written. All I have to do is hit the check mark, and I'll say yes, write changes to device, and now it's done. The instrument is now out of service. Let me go back up. The next thing we do is we're going to user trim and choose factory trim. So we are going to rewrite the factory trim settings. Number one, this number one window is the simulation of our temperature. So if I click that, and I'll enter in zero. I want to enter zero degrees. So if I was using another RTD simulator, I would be doing this on the side. But it just happens that this calibrator has a communicator built in, and that's why it's all on the same screen here. 
if you were using a separate communicator, you'd be adjusting the 0% trim, and you'd have another device where you would be sourcing your values. So I have 0 there, and I'll trim my 0% to 0. All right. Next thing I do is I will source my span. I'll source 500 degrees. Now I'll head up to my trim 100% and I'll put in 500. So I've, I've finished with that. The next thing is to change my calibration method back to user trim. Am I sure I want to write this parameter? Yes. So now that we can see that we're, we're actually sourcing 500 degrees now, and if you look on window two, it shows that we are very close to 500. And at this point, I can put it back into auto mode if I wanted to. Let me go back into the mode block, and I'll change my target. Instead of out of service, I'll put it into auto. And I don't need to do that to do this test. So I'm finished. I'll click the red X on the top right corner and hit my start button. So we can see now that our actual error is 0 0.03 degrees, roughly somewhere around there. And I've got to set to automatic mode. I've got to set to count down a couple seconds at each test point, And then it'll wait for it to stabilize. And then it'll grab that test point. But what we're seeing, instead of a, a line going like this, we have a flat line going across now. So this is how you calibrate a field bus instrument. It's the same thing with Propy bus for the most part. As far as the, uh, the signals, the screens that you're going to see, they are very similar. So I often refer to field bus and Propy bus in, in uh, uh, very similar terms. At this point, look at the calibrator. It's telling us it, that it either passed or failed. Well, it passed. Our maximum error was 0 0.091 degrees Fahrenheit. Significance means that it's 9.1 percent. We used up 9 percent of our error budget, if you will. Let me arrow down so we can take a look at our graph. That looks much better than the old one. I'll arrow down again. Here's our raw data. And if I wanted to, I could even fill in what my ambient temperature is. So in this case, we're looking about 80 degrees. And I can punch it in on the calibrator. Relative humidity is 41 right now. It's been raining a lot in Colorado. And then the device temperature, I'll leave that here. And let me save it. So I'll click the check mark. Now, I'm saving this as left. Our as found failed. And man, was that ugly. But we have the ability to calibrate it, to bring it in tolerance, and then do our as left test. That's what you want to see is a complete, a, a complete grouping. So we can continue to do as many as lefts and as many trims as we need to do, but we're done. Let me hit the back button. And if I click this button that has the magnifying glass on here, I can take a look at my actual test results. Let me go to the graph. This is the most recent one that we did. And if I hit this secret button, again, don't tell anybody about this. This is our little secret. So the top left-hand button, I'll click on Show Older Results. So watch the graph now as I click Show Older Results. Now this is the original one that we had. Now the big picture is you're going to take this data and, and unload it into an electronic form. You can print it out from there, but the, the idea is to move on from printing out forms and filing them to having a full electronic record of your calibrations, your test records. So this webinar does not go into that. It's out of the scope for what we're doing here. We'll have that in the future as far as the full uh, paperless calibration, what that looks like. But we're focusing here on just calibrating smart instruments and what that looks like. If I wanted to, I can hit that same button again and say show newer results. I can have it go back and forth. But again, I'm not going to take the time here to unload this and, and show you what a calibration certificate looks like, but it'd be very simple. So we've, we've done this calibration. 
I have, what, five different tags listed, and the bottom one is the one that we just did. So it's TT3000-F, a foundation field bus. So next, let's do a heart temperature transmitter. So we have TT150. I'll click that. And that's actually this guy right here. And I mentioned some leads before, and Tom brought up the fact that you can have accuracy issues based on your leads. If you have leads that are uh, very long, or let's say in this example, we have a four-wire RTD. If you have one set of leads that's a foot long and the other set that happens to be six feet long, you're going to have a different resistance for those leads, and that has to be uh, taken into account. So what I did is I had this setup custom made for me by a gentleman named Joe and Fort Collins to make sure that these were very similar to each other. So I've got two sets of banana jacks here, and I can easily plug these together to do my four-wire and it, it'll work for three-wire RTDs as well. And the other end is simply connected onto our transmitter. But with these two sets of wires, I had these brought within 0 .005 ohms of each other. Because I wanted them very accurate. And for those of you that are visual, 0 .005 ohms. There you go. So we'll take this. Our TT150, look on our screen, our input needs to be on the left-hand side and our output. So I'll just grab the calibrator here. We have our first set of leads for the RTD. I'll plug those in. And then I'll simply stack the other two of our four-wire onto uh, the first set. Now. The other set of our, the output for the instrument will end up connecting over here onto the bottom right. And unfortunately, the remote controller doesn't show you where I'm actually plugging into on the screen, so I just wanted you to see that. And in some cases, you may have bare wires. I want you to see this. If you have a bare wire that you're actually connecting to, but you need to hook it up to a calibrator or to a meter, you can get a fitting like this that has a little spring clamp on it, and you just push it down plug it into the wire, and now you've got some nice convenient barrel plugs to connect to your calibrator. So let me hook those up. Input, 0 to 150 degrees Celsius, 4 to 20 milliamps is our output. Supply heart, that means that we're providing loop power and we're actually putting the 250 ohm resistor in the circuit to be able to communicate with it. I'll hit the check mark. It looks like right now we have a 0.271 percent of span error. Again, zero means perfect. The, I've got this set up for my error tolerance is 0.3 percent of span. That's where the blue lines are above and below the zero. So let me hit start. And I, I've got a couple second delay set up here as well. So watch the live error reading above the graph, and then keep an eye on the bottom right as well. That tells you what we're aiming at for the next test point. And then the actual values across the top, what we're sourcing and what we're measuring. So this is a heart device, so we do have 4 to 20 milliamps out. And it looks like most of them are actually failing. So what you're seeing now is hysteresis. The question before hysteresis, what, how do we look at that? Visually, it's a difference from the test point from going up versus coming back down. And you can see that there's a gap between those two test points. It's a great example of hysteresis right here. It failed. We have a 0.353% of span error. What do I do? Do I hit cancel, tweak this thing, and then test it again? We've already talked about this. No. This is not a reflection on you as a technician. It, it's not. It's the instrument itself. It's the wiring. It's however it's installed. But if you don't capture these failed results as an as found, then you lose your, your ability to look out over time and do a history trend. Maybe you look out 10 years. And you find out that every single time you calibrate this temperature transmitter, it has to be adjusted. It always drifts down, and you always have to trim it back up. What does that tell you? 
that tells you that maybe the transmitter you're using is not a good fit for the purpose that it's in. Maybe it's not accurate enough. Maybe you need to change models. So let me save this. I'll save it as found. So here's our formula. It's, we're going to do an as found, we're going to fix it, and then we're going to do an as left with that new data. So as found, I'll hit the check mark, so now it saved it. So how do I trim this? Let me get out my screwdriver. No, you guys already know we don't use a tweaker on this. Why did you let me do that? Let me hit this super secret button on the upper left. Start communicator. So we're connecting. One thing you'll notice is that heart, because of its speed, is a little slower to bring up menus than the field bus alternative. And while this is coming up, I do want everyone to know that this, this is our second webinar in a series. The first one that we did on calibrating switches. How do you calibrate a switch? You are in control of what our next one is. So I would like some feedback. At the end of this webinar, you're going to get a, uh, a survey. And I want you to put in some information on what you'd like to see. What would you like to see calibrated? Maybe different topics. We are connected now, so we'll click online. And this is the same structure that you would see on your communicator. We're just happy to see this on our calibrator as well. All the green values are measurable variables. Device setup. Let me click on device setup. And if we wanted to rearrange this, or if we wanted to change the tag name, to change another variable on it, maybe the damping, we could go into setup and make those changes. But our goal here is we just want to trim it. So if we go to Diag Service, the next area we go to is Calibration. And I will note that every manufacturer tends to be different. And sometimes even different models within a manufacturer can be different. So they're not all the same, but there are similar screens that you'll go to. So the first thing that we'll do here, well, we have a, a zero trim and we have a variable trim. If we remember our test results, we're in a straight line and they were below our zero. So that means we have a zero trim problem. We need to fix our zero trim. If this were an old instrument, we'd just grab that zero potentiometer and start tweaking. So I'll do the uh, zero trim. Now this is the message you'd receive on your communicator as well. So the top of this screen that you're seeing is the communicator portion. The bottom section with the one window number one and the window number two, that's what's being added by the calibrator because the calibrator can actually source and measure. And another difference between this and a communicator is when this thing sources and measures, it's actually a, it, it gives you traceability because this is a calibrated standard in itself. And a communicator is not a calibrated standard. That's probably the biggest difference. Warning, loop should be removed from automatic control. You don't want the operator to get an alarm when you take this thing out of auto. So that's the reason for this. You want to let the operator know, hey, I'm taking this thing down right now so I can calibrate it. Warning, this will affect sensor calibration. And we're seeing that we have zero degrees in and 3.9561 milliamps out. We want this thing to be closer to four milliamps. This is our problem. This instrument happens to have multiple sensors and I, and working on sensor one here. So let me hit the check mark. Apply zero input to sensor. We do have it applied already, so I'll hit check. Watch the output. Window number two. Now we're going closer to four milliamps. No screwdriver required. So we'll hit the check. Now on the top it says calibration executing method. This is the instrument itself running a method. So at this point we have to sit back and just wait. Even if you're using a standard communicator, you cannot speed this thing up. You can't uh, make it go any quicker, so just wait for this to finish. While this is going, 
when you do have the chance to fill out that survey at the end, when we do appreciate your time in doing that, I, I do want to reiterate that we want you to tell us where to go next. What are you interested in as far as uh, calibration topics? Where do you want this to go? We have wireless. What are we doing with wireless? How do you calibrate a wireless heart or an ISA 100 wireless setup? Multivariable instruments, that's another topic option. So we appreciate your feedback. And again, while we're going along, please feel free to fill out that Q&A section. Don't use the chat, but fill in Q&A to give us some questions to answer at the end. All right, this is done. So at this point, I can hit the X to close the communicator portion. And now I'm back in the test. So we, we already see our zero is much better. Negative 0.006% of span. Let me hit start. We'll let this get going. So one thing I did on purpose with this instrument was we're, we're looking at it pretty close. We have a tolerance listed of 0.3% of, of span. So I'm not worried the fact that we're getting a hysteresis reading here. If we were pulled out farther, say a half a percent of span or 1% of span, you wouldn't even see that hysteresis. It would be appear as a flat line. So I'm, I've got the tolerance set very low on purpose. But we can still trim it in, and we still bring it in to within spec. So it's done. We did a five up-down test. It passed. We only used 20% of our error uh, tolerance. So if I arrow down, I can take a look at the graph. I can take a look at the raw data if I wanted to. And I'm not going to take the time to fill in our environmental field. So let me hit Save here. And I'll save this as left. Let me hit the back button. So I can always, let me go back to the home screen, in fact. So I'm back to the home screen, and my all of my documented calibrations are under documenting calibrator. So I just click that. And I see a check mark now next to TT150. And I can click the, the magnifying glass to look at what my, what my data was. Maybe I got a call over the radio to say what was my max error. And we can use this button on the top left, and I can show the older results so we can see the difference. This is our original. Let me show the newer results, and now this is how we brought it in. So you have successfully calibrated this temperature transmitter. So for the final calibration, I'd like to switch it up a little bit and do pressure. This is a heart instrument as well. So in this example, I've got a 3051C with a manifold on the bottom. And we're going to say that this one happens to be piped in, and the connections on the bottom are, are hooked up, and it's, it's in place in the field. We're just going to disconnect it to calibrate it. So how do we connect this thing, first of all, to get pressure? Well, we could disconnect from the bottom. But what I like to do is is grab one of these vents. And if we unscrew this vent, I've loosened this up ahead of time. Don't be impressed at my strength. We'll take this little piece off. And I've got a stinger. This is referred to as a stinger. That's kind of slang. But it allows us to plug into the side here. And different manufacturers use different sizes. So we'll, we'll connect this in. And I've got the other side coming out to a 30-degree tapered tube fitting. So this is a pretty standard fitting that can be used. I just need to snug this up a little bit. All right, that's good. Next thing, we need a pressure source. So I'll be using a pressure pump, just a hand pump, 0 to 300 PSI. A pressure hose, I use a small 8 inch hose so I don't have to push as much volume to get the higher pressures. The fittings are 
are two conical fittings and then one fitting to connect to that 30 degree uh, tube fitting that I mentioned before. So this will fit a lot of different manufacturers. Then the idea here is not to need any tools. And a, and a great thing with using a hose setup like this with these fittings is that nobody will steal it because it, they won't be able to use it. So the first thing we'll do is we'll take the 30-degree uh, fitting, and I'll push that on the end here. The other two, one goes on our pressure pump, and the other one on our calibrator pressure transducer. Make sure my vent is open. Now, the calibrator, this tag is called PT-12. And I don't remember what pressure transducer to hook up to, but it's telling me the one all the way on the left. So that's this guy here. So we'll hook right up. Here. The range is 0 to 250 inches of water input, and we're getting 4 to 20 milliamps output. We're supplying loop power and heart. So let me hit the check mark here. And we're reading zero milliamps. So troubleshooting, what do we do? Well, troubleshooting wise, we're not connected to the back. That's why we're not getting anything. So I'll take my leads, I'll hook this up to the output side of the calibrator. So we're not providing it power, so it's not energized. So that's the main reason we're not seeing anything. And what I've got is, is two sets of leads like this, but if you take this little adapter, you can adapt it to a little alligator clip type fitting, and then we can just clip on to our terminals. We'll hook up to the zero, I'm sorry, the plus and the minus. There's a test lead here as well. Don't hook up to the test. That's for something else. So as soon as we hooked up, we noticed we're getting current out. That means we're hooked up and we're providing power. First thing to do is we make sure we're, we are vented on our pressure pump and we zero out our pressure transducer. And that's the button on the bottom right. You notice that the uh, top left said zero. Let me hit this again. Zero. So we're zeroing out the pressure transducer. We are not zeroing out the pressure transmitter yet. So let me hit start. Our goal is zero inches in, and, and we're already there. I've got a little window here that I'm aiming at. Let me close my, close my vent, and I'll take it up to our midpoint. And I've got it set up that, that I can be within a 4% range of my target. And even if we're not exact, we know we can calculate. We can calculate what the milliamp output should be for any given input. Now we'll head up and we'll hit our 100% point, which is 250 inches. Now I do have a fine tune knob on here that I could use, but I'm just using the, the scissor portion of the pump. And again, I'm not trying to get on exactly. Now to get down, let me just crack the vent. I could use my fine tune knob and, and back down, but we'll use the vent. I just don't want it to go too too quick. So 124.18, and the last one is zero, I'll just vent out the pump, and you'll see a countdown from five. I have a five second delay in between each test point. All right, that one, it passed, but we have a 0.477% of span error. It's almost our complete error. Let me arrow down so we can take a look at this. So it's right at our limit. We're going to go ahead and trim this thing anyway, but let me save it first. We're going to save it as found. Now I need to trim it. How do we trim? 
super secret button and ma don't tell anybody. We'll hit it top left, start communicator. Now, if your calibrator doesn't have a built-in communicator, then you'll you'll be connecting to that manually on the side. This is where you'd be connecting in and doing the 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 trimming. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to fill out the Q&A section. If we run out of time and we're not able to answer all the questions, we will address those uh, after the fact. So we'll click online. Now, what we're looking at, everything that's yellow that has a little corner flip on the side means that there's another level underneath. We need service tools. We need maintenance and pressure calibration. Now. We have a couple of different options. We we can do a, a zero, or we can do a lower trim, or an upper trim. Because zero is at ambient pressure, we can do lower or zero. It'll accomplish the exact same thing. And I'm confident we don't need to do an upper trim because our error was simply above a zero, and it was a flat line. So let me do a lower. So we're executing the method inside the unit. Warning loop should be removed from automatic control. Again, a heads up to let the operator know that you're taking this thing out of the system. We are using inches of water. Apply low pressure. So we're applying zero inches of water. Now keep an eye on this number two window. Because right now zero equates to 4.0758 milliamps. Let me hit the check mark. Now it says press next when the pressure is stable. So I, I did that. And now it's asking us, what value did you actually apply? Well, we applied zero. So let me hit the check mark. So now it's adjusting for that. Did you watch the number two window? It's adjusting itself to be trimmed at zero. Now it says remove pressure. And the lower trim succeeded. We're waiting for it to finish. Here we go. Now there's a check mark, and it's executing method up at the top. So we just need to wait for that. Then we'll do our as left, then we'll be done. And once we're done, we'll do our Q&A. So we just have one more setup to do. All right, that's completed. I'll hit the check mark. I'm sorry, the X. So. We're already zeroed out. We're good there. Let me hit start. Just doing our countdown for set point number one. So I'll close off our vent, start applying pressure. to 100%, which is 250 inches. So I went over a little bit. I'm still within that 4%, so it's going to go ahead and accept it. It's able to calculate what the current should be for 254 inches, so not a problem. If I had to, I could have just pulled it back down again and raised it back up. Not a big deal. So I just made a mistake. I went too far on my midpoint. So what do I do? Do I slowly increase the pressure to go back up to it? No. No. What we want to do is we actually want to increase the pressure and go back up and then come back down to it. When you're going up in pressure, you always go up without coming back down. Otherwise, you bring in hysteresis into the mix. So I'm coming back down, and I went too far, so I had to go back up past my test point and then come back down again. So it's no big deal. So I'm hitting my vent, trying to get back into that midpoint again. So I'll go ahead and use the fine tune knob. So there we go, 121. It's counting down. 
last one, I just vent out my pump. So we're done with the pump now. Okay, so this one passed. Now our previous one passed as well, but it was really uh, close to our limit. Let me just save this as left. And I'll go back and just show you the test results real quick. So we'll look at our graph. So this is what we ended up with. And I'll hit the upper left-hand button to show all the results. This is where we came from. It was still passing, but it was right on the border. So we trimmed this one again without a screwdriver. This is using SMART protocol. This is how you calibrate SMART instruments. So Michaela, what questions do we have? All right, let me get back to the main screen here. And before we jump into the questions, I know we're getting close uh, to the end of time. I, I know we mentioned that this was only an hour and a half webinar. Um, so before we jump into the Q&A session, I just wanted to um, remind everybody that if you'd like to discuss this topic face-to-face, -face, you can visit Roy at ISA's Process Control and Safety Symposium. Uh, it's in Houston, Texas, October 6th through the 9th. If you haven't registered yet, that's okay. Registration is still open. Um, you can contact me for more information or visit isa.org. Um, and if you missed any portion of this webinar or if you'd like to watch the recorded version because you can't stay on for much longer for the Q&A, um, I'll be emailing all registrants a link to the recording. Uh, along with additional links for supporting information. So be on the lookout for an email from me in the next week or so. Um, let's go back here. Um, so we'll, and if for any reason we're not able to get to everybody's questions during this final Q&A session, um, I have the presenter's contact information on this slide here, so feel free to reach out to them. Okay, let's see. First question asks, is there any way on the calibrator slash communicator to superimpose both graphs, uh, both graphs, i.e. pre and post adjustment? So on the on the calibrator, no, but that's something that is done in the calibration software. Once you unload that, both the as found and the as left are superimposed onto the same graph in a calibration certificate. Good question. Okay, when calibrating a pressure or D slash P transmitter, what is the difference between zeroing the transmitter and trimming the low sensor? So, okay, that's another good one. So on a pressure, so this is a differential pressure that I just tested. And normally on a differential pressure where you're measuring flow, you actually hook up to the high side and vent your low side out to atmosphere and just apply positive pressure. Now, the difference between a lower value, lower range value, and a zero trim is if you have this thing calibrated, let's say 0 to 250 like I had it, but you calibrated it in an upright position in the, in the lab. If you go out in the field and you install it, but it's rotated 90 degrees, that will affect the output. So that affects the, the diaphragm inside where the pressure is applied to. So in that case, you would do a zero trim instead of a lower range value. You would go out in the field, hook up your communicator, do a zero trim with it being rotated at 90 degrees and then it would zero out the transducer at that orientation. And one other example is if, if the pressure, if your zero value wasn't really zero, if it were a level transmitter, and maybe your, your lower range value was two inches of water and your upper range was 11 inches of water, your zero would not be at zero. Your zero would be zero and your uh, lower range value would be two. So they could be two separate things. 
All right. Our next question, they're asking about what is uh, a little bit more details about the calibrator you've been using to make model and the cost. Um, if any attendees have that question, just feel free to reach out to Roy um, individually using that email address that is shown on the screen. Um, next question. How can we calibrate the differential pressure transmitter by using heart communication? So did that one come, that was probably a little bit earlier because that we actually just did that. So oh, okay. We just calibrated it using heart by trimming our zero value and truing that out. So I believe that's been addressed. All right. Um, next question, when uh, when do we need to make a D slash A converter trim? So, Tom? Well, if you've defined when calibrating the device that the input measured by the device is accurate, but the output is still not the correct milliamp value, then you would need to adjust the D to A converter, the digital to analog output converter, by doing a D to A converter trim. Okay. Next question. Um, I saw a mobile app that works as heart communicator using serial USB cable. Can I use it for quick fix when a regular heart communicator? That question wasn't finished, but maybe you get the gist of it. You know, I think you could use it as long as the capabilities of that little portable unit were enough. If it did have enough of the DD files to do those, the, the sensor trimming functions, the zero, the D to A trim then yes, it should work for that. I, I am familiar with another pocket PC-based unit that is a communicator as well, and, and that will accomplish it. So I, I think the answer is yes. All right. How can we uh, calibrate interface level transmitter with heart? Hmm. Not sure of the question. Not sure of the question. If it's a heart transmitter, then you should be able to access it either directly through a heart modem or possibly through a converter that takes a heart modem signal and converts it to, say, heart over Ethernet or some other protocol. All right. Is there a preference as to whether the D slash A trim or sensor should be adjusted first? Well, I believe you would adjust the sensor first, and then if the output isn't accurate, go after the D to A trim. Uh, Roy, do you have input on this? So I, I would agree with that. The, the bottom line is that You've already done your as-found test at that point and known, shown that it was out enough to need to be trimmed. I've, it's okay to run them in either order. But I do, I do tend to do the sensor first as well. Um, another question. Uh, does your calibrator have a four-wire source function like the Fluke 744? The, both the Fluke 744 and this MC6 calibrator use two wires to simulate. The four wires used on the RTD measurement circuit. So both use a two-wire to simulate. And if, when you're using uh, a four-wire source, then you're stacking the leads like I did in the beginning. All right. And going back to some of our older questions, and maybe these have been answered already, um, 
but this question comes from Ron. He asks, are there basic rules for choosing field bus and profit bus over heart? Well, foundation field bus can be preferred if you want to distribute control from the field bus master out to the field devices themselves. Uh, that protocol has the capability of doing local PID control, local segment uh, control on the segment. Uh, it's faster, and plus there are function blocks that are used to, de to define what the field device is, how it behaves, um, what functions it has. So that goes beyond what HART provides. But it's hard to beat a 4 to 20 milliamp loop with a HART protocol on it for ease of creating the network and ease of troubleshooting. So a lot of it has to do with speed and what functions you want the the system to have and where you want those functions to be. Do you want them all to be, in essence, at the master level, or do you want to distribute them throughout the network for a little bit more robustness, a little more reliability uh, during operation? That's a simple question with a complicated answer, but that's kind of the overview right there. Okay. Next question. Can the demonstrated calibrator measure atmospheric pressure? Yes, it can. So you, you right. show you the actual barometric pressure of wherever you are. All right. This next individual asks if we could list all the instruments used during the process of calibration. So is that asking about what instruments we've actually calibrated or what we've used to perform the calibration? Because if it's what we've used to perform the calibration, it's simply a, a BMAX MC6 calibrator. And with the pressure, I had a, a pressure pump. But that's the only piece of equipment that I use to perform all the activities. Okay, and next question. As far question. as the instruments, the pressure was a, a, a Rosemont. 3051C, and then I had a couple PR electronics, 5337 and a 5350. Okay. Um, next question. Will you describe how to calibrate level transmitter because there are so many types, um, so possibly arrange another webinar for it? So that one would require an entire webinar. So we really don't have time to, to go into that one, but that's a, a great topic, and we'll, we'll put that in the bucket for the next one. And from your experience, any typical problems with heart? Besides the fact that it's a little bit slow, and also, um, I see in the chat room a fellow has defined that some of the older Fisher ROC products will pick up the heart protocol and become confused. So when calibrating those, he he uh, turns off or removes heart messaging from the loop. Also, I've seen issues where had someone uh, powering their heart loop with a train, a little train set. Uh, power transformer, which, yes, it produced 24 volts DC, but had a huge amount of AC noise also that it introduced to the loop, so much so that it blanketed hard communication and made it difficult to consistently communicate to devices on the loop via heart. So those are the kinds of problems I've seen. You know, let me make one comment on that. It's kind of a – the question was have I seen any – well, issues with heart. I'm, my overall response to that is no. But let me say regarding heart and field bus, I still go out to customer sites frequently with even new installations, and it's it's a combination of, um, of heart and then uh, some use field bus. So even though field bus is newer, it doesn't mean that everyone's going that route. There are pros and cons to um, 
to both uh, protocols. And I'm saying field bus as a generic for Profibus and Foundation Field Bus. Okay. Next question. Uh, what does it mean by having instrument out of service while trimming instrument through calibrator? That means that it's not going to be controlled by the, by the process. Tom, do you have a better explanation of that? Yeah, it means that um, certain messaging created by the instrument is not occurring. It is out of service. It reports back to the master that it's out of service um, so that the supervisory control system or the master can know that this particular point is no longer valid as you're messing around with your pressure input values and things like that. Um, the control system knows it's not a valid point to be used in uh, controlling the process. Good. You could also call it just being taken offline. All right. How would you set the calibrator up when you won't be providing the source signal, i.e. when checking the analog output of a mag flow meter? So if the calibrator is not sourcing the value, you can simply key in the entry. So with a mag flow meter, you could do that. You can key in what the reading is you have. The same thing if you're calibrating a we're verifying a pressure indicator that happens to be a dial. The calibrator can't read a, a dial, so you'd manually type in what the value you're reading on the dial. So the same thing. Uh, Roy, can, can the calibrator measure an active as well as a passive 4 to 20 milliamp loop? Yes. Okay. Oh, wait, okay. when you said active versus passive, I was... Define what you mean by those. Active would be a 4 to 20 milliamp loop, maybe for a mag flow meter, that is powered by an external 24 volt source, and all the mag flow meter does is regulate the loop. And so if you introduce your calibrator into that loop, it's measuring a 4 to 20 milliamp signal that's already powered by some other source somewhere else. Yes. That's an active yep. loop. A passive that's what I loop thought would you be where. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and a passive loop would be where say the magnet flow meter is a two-wire device and there is no separate power supply in series on the loop, you introduce your calibrator into the loop and now it has two functions to perform. It has to measure the magnet flow meter, but first it has to power the loop too. So does your calibrator have a built-in excitation source for powering a 4 to 20 milliamp loop? It does. It does, okay. All right, last question here and then we've got to wrap up. Um, can we calibrate smart positioner uh, control valve? So that's a, that's a complicated question. And the main purpose of this is for pressure and temperature devices. If it's a method that can be run from the DD when you hook up with a communicator, then yes, it can run through that. So you can communicate with a smart positioner. But normally you're not going to use a, a handheld calibrator to actually calibrate that device and to capture data. There are other tools for that. Okay. Well, these have been some great questions, and unfortunately we don't have enough time to answer them all. So if we missed your question or we you know, couldn't answer it fully um, and you want to discuss it more in depth, feel free to reach out to the presenters using their email addresses as shown on the screen. Um, and another call out to ISA's Process Control and Safety Symposium um, that BMEX will be at. Uh, registration is still open. And if you, and I know I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but if you missed any portion of this webinar, it um, is being recorded and we're going to post it up on our site. Um, in probably a few days, and I'll send you a link to that recording so you can access it. And once this webinar closes, a survey will pop up in your browser. And like Roy mentioned, we will want you to take a few minutes to fill out the survey and tell us about your experience.
but in particular, we really want to know your feedback about um, what you'd like to see in our next webinar. And this concludes the Configuring and Calibrating Smart Instruments webinar. We thank you all for attending and hope you acquired useful information. I hope to see you again in one of our future webinars.